Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today began lesson four on the kingdom family, and uh, we have been looking at the four steps. Let me quickly summarize for you what we have been going through, and this is the same summary as last week, uh, except we're at a different step. Uh, we realize that there are two spirits that's been released in the world today. There's the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of restoration. The problem is, you know, when we're raising our families, um, our focus have, have not always been right. In, you know, most Christian families, and including most Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Malaysian, you know, if we're loving families, we want things to go well for our children. So we focus on education, make sure that they can get a good job and that they have enough money. And those are all good focus, but there may not be the best thing for us to focus on. So often we go through life and we don't think about these kind of things until the end of life, until we don't have that much time remaining, until we attend a funeral. That's when we really get down to it and think about, you know, what we have missed out on our lives. Maybe our relationship with our spouse or our children have not been the best. And if we realize that we don't have that much time remaining, quite often people would think back and reflect on their lives and they would say something along the line. I wish I had spent more time or I wish I had done better with my family. So one of the questions that we had asked is, what kind of life do we want for our family? So if you really sit down and reflect on it, then it's something that you want to live out and something that you want to model. Because if we are going to train up our children in the ways of the Lord, and we want them to have that kind of life, and we want that kind of life, it's something that we want to live. So if we look in the Bible, in terms of families, in terms of children, what is God's focus for us? What are the most important things that God wanted us to do? So the last couple of weeks, you know, we looked at number one and number two. Number one is to love them, love our family, love our children, love our spouse, and to enjoy the time with them. Number two is we teach them to obey. At a very young age, but also keep this in mind that when they're teenagers, it's not about teaching them to obey anymore. Because you're trying to mold them to become the men or the women of God that God wants them to be and that you would like to see for them. So when they become teenagers, it's not about telling them, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. Because eventually they will become an adult and they have to make their own decisions. So as teenagers, you want to start building a good relationship with them and you want to start guiding them and giving them opportunities to make right decisions. And then number three, this is what we are going to be talking about. Ephesians 6 words said, don't provoke the children to anger. Another way of expressing it is try to live at peace with them. So because if, you know, you have two types of environment, you have anger and you have peace. So this is the thing that we're going to be focusing on today. And we are going to look at different situations and how we're going to handle the different situation. So we'll be discussing that today. So let's take a look at Ephesians 6.4. Parents, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And another translation, the TLB. And now a word to you, parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves, with suggestions and godly advice. Now, all this sounds great. It sounds wonderful, you know, if we can raise them up in loving discipline and loving the Lord himself. 
the discipline the Lord himself approves. And being able to make suggestion and godly advice so that we can direct them in the ways of the Lord. All of this sounds great, but how do we do that? Is it even possible? Some of you have little children. Some of you have older children. Maybe some of you might not have any children, but you want to learn so that you can help. So we're all at different stages in our lives. And maybe some of you now are grandparents. So think about this. Think about the difference between these two environments that Ephesians 6, 4 about. What are the differences? So most of us, if not all of us, have had situation with our family, whether it's with our spouse or our kid. When a certain situation comes up, we get upset at them or they get upset with us. And, you know, sometimes it's not very pleasant. So sometimes, you know, anger takes over. Sometimes we don't talk to them. Sometimes they don't talk to us. Sometimes they ignore us. And sometimes they throw temper tantrums. And when they become teenagers, sometimes they're even ashamed of us. You know, they would rather be with their friends than with us. But how do we do this? How do we bring up the children with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord? So these are the two environments. One, you have a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. Two, you have a lot of peace, a lot of obedience, a lot of joy. Because they want to follow Jesus or they want to follow the Lord. So it's clear here that there are two environments. The question is, how do we help people to get, how do we help our family live in the second environment? And by the way, even though this is an instruction to parents, for children, it actually applies to life. Because once you learn the principle, you know, in regard to, Re this is principle for relationship. If you can learn to apply it to your children, actually, if you learn to apply with your spouse, then you'll be able to apply with your children. Then you'll be able to apply it at church, at work, anywhere you go, because the principle are pretty much the same. So let's take a look at ways that people provoke the children to anger. So I just went online and I, I did a, a search you know, uh, ways that parents make the children angry. And this is not an all-inclusive list. These are just some of the items that I found. Um, but there are so many ways. Let's take a look at some of these. One, if we place unrealistic expectation on our children. Think about that. You know, a lot of times, Parents, uh, especially Asian parents, we want children to make straight A's. Why? Because we want them to go to a good college and we want them to get a, a good job so that they can make money to support themselves. And sometimes you might have one of the kids who might not be the best in a certain subject. Let's say if they're not good at math and we keep forcing them and comparing them. How come you can't make A's? Look at your brother, look at your sister, look at how good they are. So, I want you to think a little bit about this. If our focus is on money and education, and if that's the number one goal, it's really easy to place unrealistic expectation on children. If our focus is on their talents and their ability, it's really to place really easy 
to place unrealistic expectation. What is the Bible's teaching on a kid's personality and their gifts? It's Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, you work at it with all your heart. It's unto the Lord and not for men, for you know it's the Lord Christ that you're serving. So I want to be honest with you here. For me personally, some of you know that I had to homeschool my children. And when we first started out homeschooling, uh, you know, there weren't that many Asian people in Houston that, who were homeschooling their children. And my mom and relatives, they never heard of homeschooling. So when we went into it, a lot of people were like, oh, this is a bad idea. You're going to hurt your kids. They're not going to have a good education and all these things. But, you know, after a couple of years, my mom was pretty impressed. And, you know, after a few more years, she didn't have any problem with it anymore. And as some of you know, my son, Simi, has graduated and he went on to to college, so he's in college now. And you know, yesterday he texted me. He said, Dad, can we talk? Do you have time? So we talked, well, I don't know, maybe 40, 45 minutes or so about different things. You know, a year or so ago, when I was in Japan and Kay was here in Houston, you know, after we were married, uh, I was talking to Kay, and we were looking at one another through the video, and she, I said, what's going on at home? How's everybody? And then she just took the camera on her phone, and she just showed me the environment. And Simi was sitting right here where I'm sitting, talking to you, and he was doing his homework. He likes to do his homework on his desk. And he was 18 years old. And I remember, talking to Kay, and I said, Kay, Simi's 18, I'm 17. I don't ever remember telling the kids that they had to do their homework. Think about that. One of the environment where parents cause children to be angry is when they try to get kids to do their homework and the children don't do their homework, or the children might do their homework and their grades are not that good. Well, Maybe the grade is a B and not an A, and they get upset. So today I want to point out different environments where it's possible for us to get kids to become angry. And we get angry, and the environment becomes full of anger. And then also we're going to talk about adult children too, because some of us make mistakes and the children become adult, and now it's a big mess. Okay, we'll talk about that too. Because I'm going to try to help cover as many of the different environments as possible. But I was talking to Kay, I said, like, Kay, I've never, I've never, uh, I don't remember 18 years, 19 years now, ever having to tell my children that they had to do their homework. Do you know what that means? That means there was not one time I was angry with them for doing their homework or not doing their homework, for having good grades or having bad grades. Never one time. So that was taken out of my life. It was taken out of our lives, our family. We didn't grow up. You know, the kids can grow up getting fearful about their homework and not doing their homework and so on. Why? Because, you know, yesterday in the Kingdom Discipleship Training, we focused on meditating and obeying. Because one of the verse that I had been meditating and obeying on is Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, you work at it with all your heart as unto the Lord and not for me. And for you know it's the Lord Christ you're serving. So I have been teaching my children ever since they're young that whatever they're going to do, do the very best for Jesus. So if they are going to be doing their homework, just do the very best for Jesus. If they get an A, they get an A. If they get a B, they get a B. But they try their very best for the Lord. 
So I've never had the expectation that they have to, you know, make the best of grade. And you know the beauty about it. Listen to what happened. Both of my children, they did, they're doing very well in this school. Uh, actually, both of them have been making like almost straight A's in all of their classes and singing. Before he went to college, he had to take the entrance exam, uh, the college entrance exam. He finished in the top 1%. My daughter is doing so well in her schooling and they both take initiative. And I've never had to force them to do their homework. I never was angry with them one time. Even sometimes when they feel like they're not doing well in the class, I said, it's okay. I said, I'm proud of them because I know they're giving their best. As long as they give their best, I'm very proud of them. As long as they do it for Jesus. So this is the environment. That environment produces peace. And yet, it produces children that are able to make the decision and they choose to do the best with Jesus. But not only in terms of education, but in terms of life, in terms of how they care for people, in terms of going to church. I mentioned this to you guys. I've never had problem with my kids going to church. Not one time. I've never had problem with waking them up. So don't place unrealistic expectation. See, the unrealistic expectation is based on what we think are the most important things. And it's not necessarily what God thinks is the most important thing. Number two, we give our children too much freedom. See, people, or the other way around, we are too strict on our children. Let me explain. There's two extremes here, and you have to understand the situation. When children are small, when they're babies and they're small, children love boundaries. They need boundaries. They're more secure with boundaries, even with little babies. You know, when babies are born, if you wrap them really tight and you put them in a crib, they sleep much better. But if you make the cloth, you know, very loose, they'll flap around and they don't get as much of good sleep. Why? Because they're so used to when they're in the mother's room, they were very tight in the womb. So they're used to being tight. And they love boundaries. Children are very secure with boundaries. You know, one of the problem with kids being diagnosed with ADD, ADHD in the last 10, 20 years is because in the last 10, 20 years, the spirit of the world has been released. Children become more rebellious. Uh, children are given too much freedom. There's no more boundaries. And if you don't give kids boundaries, <clears throat> they are going to be acting up. Now, what's the difference between giving boundaries and being too strict on our children? See, children, please understand the stages of growth for the children. When they're a little baby, they're totally dependent on us. When they're little children, they're mostly dependent on us. When they're teenagers, when they're teenagers, they're transitioning to adulthood. When you're thinking, if they are transitioning to adulthood, what are the changes? There are changes physically, there are changes emotionally, there are changes spiritually. As parents, how do you help children transition to adulthood? Don't you want them to learn to make their own decisions? You want them to learn to make the right decisions. See, sometimes parents don't think about that. And sometimes we just let children, you know, we just keep making decisions for them. And if you are too strict with your teenage kids, they will rebel against you. They think it's control. 
I'm not saying you don't set any boundaries. You have to set good, loving boundaries, even as teenagers. Let me give you an example. I'll give you examples of when my kids were small. So when my kids were little children, I had many different boundaries for them. And you've heard me talk about, I train them to sit in a blanket that I would carry with me and I go and visit different people. I put them down in a blanket and I minister to people. Or if I need time, if we have, you know, a wife time, spouse time, husband and wife time, I put on the blanket, put a toy, you know, put a book. Both of them will play with one another, you know, on that blanket for an hour, two hours, no problem at all. And I put boundaries, like they can't go into the kitchen. And after I train them, from that day onward, they don't go into the kitchen. So there were many different boundaries at home. But mind you, I spent a lot of time with them. And like I said, the last couple of weeks, we played a lot of games together. We go out when they need help with the work and their schooling. I'm always there. And, you know, when my kids were small, we would play board games and card games till midnight or one o'clock and we'll eat our popcorn or snacks and we had such a great time and we played uno or whatever you know when they were little kids so i spent a lot of time with them but i put boundaries in terms of what they cannot do but when they were eight years old i started training how to use a knife so that they can start learning how to cook and then when they were about 10 years old, 10, 11 or so, maybe nine or 10 or something like that, the two of them actually cleaned 50 fish by themselves, 50. We counted it, it was 50 fish that they cleaned. That means they cut off the head, they cut off the inside, they took all the stuff out, they took the scale out, you know, and they clean and make it nice and clean so we can eat it. So, I had the boundaries, but I went too strict on them. You know, I know where I was going. I want them to learn how to handle a knife so that in the future they can cook. So they learned to cook. And there was a period where they loved watching cooking shows. Uh, what's that cooking shows? Chop. You know, the cooking show, Chop, when you have four, you know, uh, chefs and they cook a meal with some ingredient and then they have judges and then out of the four one of the, the person will get chopped you know get cut off and they say oh these three are better and then out of the three you know they remove one the two and then out of the two they choose one so the two kids they love cooking when they were little and and so we played the game of chop at home we said okay these are the ingredients the two of you have to cook a meal with it and they would cook a meal and they said, okay, dad, you are our judge. So they want me to judge. And this, I have a problem judging because it's hard for me to choose which one is better. And I would say, hmm, this one's a seven. Okay, oh, this one, also a seven. <laughs> so, but you see, I set the boundaries for them. But at the same time, you know, based on their age, I start giving them more responsibilities and start teaching them that they can do certain things at a certain age. And by the time they become teenagers, by the time they become teenagers, I'm beginning to let them make some choices in their life. Like, you know, and I would send them out to missions. And I would ask them if they wanted to go. And they said yes, and I would release them. And they would go to different places, you know, a missions trip. Sometimes some of the poorest places. When they were 12, 13, they went out on the first mission and I couldn't go with them, I, but they went. And they would go to poor villages in different countries. And they would live like the people at times. And they come back and they get so excited about mission. They get excited about the homeless people. They just get excited about ministry. So that's the environment that they kind of grew up in. 
And, you know, also, when they're teenager, my um, son got his driver's license when he was 17 years old. My daughter, she really wanted the driver's license. So when she, on her birthday, when she became 16, I took her to the Texas Department of Public Safety. She took her driving test. She got her driving license at 16 years old. A driver's license in the U.S. means that you can drive by yourself. So she started driving when she was 16 years old. But I have been training her. I taught Sydney how to drive. I taught Eileen how to drive. And I, was, I knew they can drive, and they can drive pretty well. So at 16, you know, I was traveling. And when they needed to go to school, they needed to go, go grocery, they could drive. No problem. So it's knowing the, how much freedom we want to give the kids, but we knowing the boundaries that you set. But also knowing the stages. When they become teenagers, you want to give them more freedom, but you want to help guide them to make the right decision. And the way to do it is this, is that if you don't have a good relationship with them, if there's no the foundation of love and spending time with them with love and being available for them to ask you questions, when they're teenagers, they, it's hard for them to come ask you questions. But for me, I've never had that issue because even as teenagers, my kids will come and ask me questions. You know why seeming at Last night, called me and we talked for about 40 minutes because he wanted to ask me certain questions about certain things, whether it was good or not for him to do. And we talk about these things. And even now, the kids will do that when there's a need. But I don't force them to do it. We just establish it. If they need it, they can always do it. So even when they become adult and they have families and they get stuck in a situation, there's a need. They can call me because we've already established that at a young age. Don't ridicule your children. Don't fail to affirm them. Don't abuse the children physically or emotionally. Don't call children bad names. Okay, all of these are, are related. See, sometimes some people think it's just a big joke. So sometimes we don't, you know, out of our anger. Have you noticed that when you're angry, it's easy to say things that you really don't mean? It's because you're angry. <laughs> it's not just you. I, I've done this in my life as well. When I'm angry, and I say, in my thought, it's, it's happening so fast. I'm so angry. You hurt me? Well, I want to hurt you back. Well, you think I did you wrong. Look at what you did to me. You did me wrong too. And I point all these things out. The culture sometimes teaches us that the culture sometimes teaches us to not say good things about our children, to not say good things about our wives. But it goes against the word of God. The Bible teaches us, let praise come out of our mouth. Let blessing comes out, come out of our mouth. See, the tongue, it's a very dangerous you know, instrument. It can bring blessing or it can bring curses. And too often, we let our tongue bring curses to our children. But I said, no, I'm not going to accept it. I'm going to praise my kids. I'm going to praise my wife. I'm going to praise people around me. So I try my best to never ridicule my kids. You know, now I would joke with them, but I don't call them names. I, I don't abuse them emotionally. I, I don't do the manipulation game. You know, there are some mothers in particular, dads can do it too, but mothers more so, especially in Asian culture. They manipulate the children, the daughter. You know, Kay and I visited my mom 
my sister uh, a couple of days ago. And we were, and they were watching this Thai drama, uh, a drama from Thailand. And the mother, you know, the mother saw one of the older daughters was coming home and the servant told the mother, your daughter's coming home. She's outside. And the mother took some water because somebody had died recently. One of the relatives or something had died. And the mother took some wa water and put it on her eyes, pretend there were tears. And, and then, you know, why? Because she was trying to manipulate her daughter to do something, you know, based on that. Oh, I'm grieving so much. You need to do this. And it happens so often in Asian countries. And they even do that to manipulate older kids. So be careful about what you say. Choose its words to affirm them, to lift them up, to praise them. You know, I've noticed there are times when my kids say, oh, I'm not doing this well, I'm a bad person, I'm this, 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 because the, you know, sometimes we're like that. Sometimes we think we're not good enough. That's the lie of the enemy. So I affirm them instead of saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you're so bad or whatever. Finding fault constantly with our children and refusing to admit our faults to our children. Finding fault with our children, refusing to admit our own fault. Actually, this can apply to any relationship. You know, like when you get married, it is so easy to find faults in the other person. And it's also so easy to not admit our own fault. One of the things that I teach in Kingdom Life is try not to change the other person, especially with marriage. Try, don't, don't try to change the other person. You can influence them, especially when they're adults. But if you're constantly finding faults, you know, there was one time we were talking to a couple and they had a, a daughter and the daughter was an obeying, teenage daughter that wasn't obeying. Um, but the other children were obeying. And so in that situation, mom and dad, it was very easy to see, well, my oldest daughter, she doesn't obey. So she's this, she did this, well, she is just, and the dad was having a hard time with the oldest daughter. And it's easy to see the fault. So we were talking about it. I said, well, why doesn't she want to obey? Could it be because she has a strong leadership gifting? And she thinks that she just needs to. And, and this young lady does have a strong leadership gifting. But she didn't understand as a leader for the Lord, you need to learn to grow in serving. But if we see the fault, we always tell them, you're not doing this right, you're a bad person. And they get angry and sometimes they believe they're a bad person. See, it's okay for us as parents to see weaknesses in our children, but if you always point out the weaknesses and you don't point out the good things, and your relationship is not strong with them, you, it's gonna be hard for you to help them grow in their weaknesses. But if you have good relationship with them and they come to you and you explain it to them, then they want to grow so that they can be stronger, especially if they understand why and how they can use their gifts. And a couple, a few months back, you know, my children were saying to me and to Kay while we were eating, they were saying that dad, me, I don't do a good job of listening to them. They say something and then I forget. They ask me questions. It takes me, you know, sometimes I don't answer these kind of things. So, you know, after thinking about it for a few days, I finally apologize to them. I said, I'm sorry. And I'll try to do better in that area. 
you know, it's good for us to model for them. If you want them to admit their faults, if you think it's good for them, then be willing to admit your fault. All right, now let's move to discipline. Sometimes people discipline children in anger, and sometimes they're inconsistent with disciplining. Mm. Discipline. The world today say that using a rod to spank the kids to discipline, it's wrong. And in some countries, they're outlawing it. They're saying you can't do that anymore. Um, it's not wrong. The Bible said it's good. We'll look at some verses in the future. Using the rod, it's good for the kids. But using the rod in anger becomes abusive. But if you're spanking your kids in love, it's really a good thing. So I would spank my children when they were small and up to a certain age. I can't remember what age, whether it was seven or eight. It was a certain age, I stopped spanking them. But I remember when I was spanking them when they were very little. It was wonderful. Often they would come to me and after the spanking, they would say, Daddy, I love you. Now that's a good spanking. That's a good discipline. Why? Because disciplining with the rod drives away the folly. The Bible said folly is down up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far away. So the rod of discipline, it gets rid of the junk in their heart. It makes them feel so much better. It gives them more peace. It gives them more joy. It helps them to walk in the right path if it's done in love. But discipline is not only with the rod. It's when they get older, when the kids get older. Discipline could be don't give them certain things that they really want. You know, if they whine for things, I'm not giving it to them. So sometimes it's, you know, you set certain guidelines. Sometimes it really, if you do this, you don't get to play your video game for one whole week. And I mean it. And by the way, my kids never had issues with video games. Did they play some video games? Yes. But they were never addicted to video games. Why? Why? Because we had time together. Because I showed them how to read. You know, I taught my kids how to read. By the way, I learned a way to teach children how to read, babies how to read. I started teaching Singley when he was 18 months. I spent one minute a day with him, maybe five days a week. Before he turned three, he was reading first grade books. One minute a day. I taught them how to read, and I taught them the joy of reading. And so they would read a lot. And we, would, and we didn't even have a TV at home. We didn't need it. And we would read, and we would play games, and we would go outside, and we would do things. We'd go to the park a lot back then when they were little. Museum, we went to museum a lot. We spent time with them. And so they were never addicted to video games. Why? Because we invested time with them. That was the key. Did we allow them to play some video games? Yes. Was it ever an issue? No. As a matter of fact, I don't remember ever telling them that they have to put down their video games. It was never an issue in our family. So be consistent in disciplining because we have certain guidelines set up. You know, and we try to be consistent in it. Food, we were consistent. You're going to eat what we put before you. Very simple. You know, with love. And you can't, little children, you can't go into the kitchen when mommy or daddy are cooking because we don't want you to get hurt. And they learn to never go into the kitchen. Never an issue. Don't compare them to siblings or to other children. Don't yell at them and disrespect them in front of others. 
See, when you say things about them in front of people, when you yell or disrespect them, oh, they'll serve her on the inside. Really, really hurt. Don't break your promises to your children. You know, if you say you're going to do something, do your very best to keep it. Don't tell them you're going to take them out and then you don't take them out. Don't tell them you're going to go to a ball game and you don't go to a ball game. And there might be legitimate reason. Now, maybe once in a while something comes up and then you can reschedule. But please, don't make a promise because when they're little children, you're like the heroes. The hero in their lives, and if you break it, you're going to hurt their heart, and eventually the heart will be shattered, and they don't look at you as a hero anymore. Don't fail to listen to your children's opinion, especially when they're teenagers. When they're teenagers, you want to direct them. And if you have marriage issues, don't show it in front of them. It's really bad. They feel really insecure. Don't live a hypocritical life. Don't teach them something that you're not doing. Don't model anger in front of your kids. You know, all that is quite a long list. And I want to be honest with you, growing up, raising my children up, I never looked at those lists. I'm never like, okay, you, you know, I've never studied the list. I never look at the list. So maybe some of you took notes. But the good news is you really don't need to know what those lists say. It's kind of hard to remember all of that, even though they're good points. But I never remember the list. The question is, how do I live it out? See, it's difficult to remember all of these things. But here was the thing for me. The key question that you want to be asking, really, what kind of life do you want for your family? What kind of life do you want for yourself? What kind of life do you want for your family? And you know, we have been talking a lot about the kingdom life, righteousness, peace, joy, love, and power. Imagine, what would it be like if your household can be filled with righteousness, peace, joy, love, and power? Look at the environment. What would it be like if you have more love with one another, if you have more peace and more joy? You see, you notice the difference. So what kind of life do you want? It boils down to that. Because if you truly want the kingdom life, the question, how do you get there? How do you have that kind of peace, that kind of joy, that kind of environment? So, so the question that I ask when I'm with my kids, when, with, when I'm with Kay, how do I cultivate that life? How do I live it? See, if your environment is full with anger and hurt, something is wrong. If you get angry with your kids 30% of the time, that's too much. Some people, they get angry with the kids 70% of the time. 50% of the time. It's way too much. Maybe we can get angry with our kids 10% or 5% or 1% of the time. So when I'm in situation with my kids, with my wife, with Kay, I am thinking, what kind of life do I want? And how do I get there? You know, recently, when Kay and I had an argument, 
I'm thinking, how do I get back to this environment? What happened there? And I would approach Kay and let her know, Kay, I love you. But let's see, how do we best deal with this situation? And we're learning. Kay and I are learning. Look, I love Kay very much. I love my kids very much. We have a wonderful family, but we don't have a perfect family, and none of us has a perfect family. We still have arguments at times, but we're learning. The, we're trying to find and learn the best way to deal with the situation as they come up. But sometimes we do a very excellent job at it, and sometimes we don't. And when we don't, then we learn from it and we say, well, let's try to do it so that next time we don't get into that, you know, hole again. So have I been angry with my kids? Of course. Have they been angry with me? Of course. Have I been angry with Kay? You'll be surprised. Kay is such an amazing lady. But so you I know you're going to be surprised. Yes, I've been angry with her. Has she been angry with me? Oh, that's an easy answer. Because sometimes I make silly mistakes. <laughs> but I love her very much. And I love my kids very much. How do you get the family to live that? So the Bible said, don't provoke them to anger, but live in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Live in the life the way that God wants us to live. Let me share some real life situation with me, my family, and how I handle some of those situations. Because these are situations where there would be opportunities for me to get angry or to cause my children to be angry or the family to be angry. So I have a picture here to show you. And this is Kay, as you can tell right there, Kay. And she's holding a Frisbee disc. So singing, my son loves to play what we call disc golf. This is Frisbee. And it's like in golfing, in regular golfing, you have a um, club and you swing at a ball and you get into a small little hole on the ground. In frisbee golf, in the same way, you know, in disc golf, you sometimes have to drive the ball a couple of hundred yards and the hole might be 300 yards away. The same thing with frisbee golf, disc golf. You take the frisbee and you throw it. And sometimes it's 200 yards, 300 yards, 400 yards away. But eventually you take this frisbee and you throw it into the basket. And there's a basket, it's a metal basket. You throw it into the, the net and it falls into the basket. So the same concept. A few years ago, my son was given one of these net because he loves to play it in an, an iron kind of net. A, one of those that you can set up and just put in your backyard. So he puts it in his back, in our backyard. And when he had it set up, he was so excited. He loved it. So he goes and practice outside. He takes a frisbee and he just throws it into it. But when he put it outside, he put it right next to my bedroom window. And it was so close to the window. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, maybe it's not a good idea to put it so close to the window. And I meant to tell him, see me, not a good idea. <clears throat> but I forgot to tell him. And he would go outside and he would practice and practice for one week. You know, he was doing pretty good practicing. And I never mentioned it to him. So a week later, I drove home 
I was out somewhere and I drove home and I saw, guess what? One of my windows was broken. Now, something for you guys to know about me, I teach that a lot of things are easy. But not everything is easy for me. Okay, it's easy for me to understand the Bible. It's easy for me to help people deal with emotional, spiritual things. But I have to confess, when it comes to physical things, like fixing the broken window, fixing the plumbing, fixing things around the house, I have to confess, I'm not very good at it. So when I saw the window being broken, my first thought was, ah, ah. You know what that means? It means either I have to find someone to help me or pay someone to help me, or I'm going to have to do it myself. And I hate doing it myself. And then we got to spend money to buy another glass and all of these things. And singing was already 18 years old. And I had a couple of choices. One of the choices is this. One of the choices. Sing me. How foolish of you. Come on, you're 18 years old. Don't you know if you put this thing right next to the window, you can break it. Uh, how stupid of you. Choice one. I could have done that. And by the way, many of us have done something like that. You're so stupid. You're so foolish. How come you don't know? Can you see this is going to happen? Choice one. Choice two. See me. It's okay. We can fix it together. And guess what I said to him? Guess which choice I made? Mm -hmm. Choice two. That's what I said to him. He was feeling really guilty. He knew what he did was wrong, to break the window. But what I said to him was this. I said, see me, it's okay. It's a mistake. But let's fix it together. Think about it. Based on our decision, the step that we take, the path that we take, it will produce a lot of hurt in him, a lot of anger in him, a lot of hurt. But do you know why I made that choice? Here's the reason. Number one, because of the kind of life that I want. But here's the thing. A broken window, it's so much easier to fix than a broken heart. Do you understand that? A broken window is so much easier to fix than a broken heart. So the decision I made helped create an environment where we have more of the kingdom, more peace, more joy, more love, instead of anger. Even when they make mistakes. You know, as Christians, sometimes we get angry at our kids because they don't get up and they're late to go to church. Or sometimes they don't want to go to church. And we keep yelling at them. And then after a while, as teenagers, we stop yelling and say, okay, don't go. I've never, not one single time, had an issue with my kids not wanting to go to church or getting up late to go to church. Not one single time. I've never had to wake them up. 
And some of you know, you know, even the last couple of years, they're 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, you know, around the age, the last couple of years. My son helped lead worship. He's the music director at the church. So sometimes they would meet at the church at 7.30, so he leaves at 7 o'clock, so he gets up at 6.30. And sometimes Eileen is on the team, so she gets up at the same time, and they go together to serve. I never have to wake them up. But how do you get to the place? Because some of us, you know, some of your family, the children don't want to go to church. Why? If you go to church and the word of God is not reality, if there's a lot of hypocrite, you know, a lot of hypocrisy, if we're not living out the life that God wants us to live, the kids will see right through it. You know, if the pastor and mommy and dad are talking about love, peace, and joy, but there's no love, peace, and joy at home, why go to church? It's hypocrisy. If the word of God hasn't impacted their lives, it doesn't matter how much you force them. You can say, go to church, and you can have some good things. You can have fellowship. You can eat pizza. You can have games. But that's not a good reason to go. And after a while, they get tired of the pizza and the games. Because the video games, it's more fun for them. How do you cultivate that kind of environment so it's so you have peace and you never have to force them to go to church? The key is for you and I to live out this kingdom life. And when we live it, God becomes real for them. And they will choose to make the decision themselves. Sometimes it seems like they are stronger with the Lord, and sometimes it seems like they're not as strong with the Lord. Sometimes they're on a high, sometimes they're on a low. But that's no different than for you and me. Sometimes we're on a high, sometimes we're on a low. The same thing. But you have to cultivate that environment. What if they don't obey you? You know, what if they don't obey? Well, sometimes parents get very angry at their kids that don't obey and we yell at them. You know, for me, it's pretty easy. We just set some guidelines and they know it. You know, if they're gonna lie, if they're gonna steal, and they're gonna commit some bad sin as a little, little child, they're gonna get us thinking. But if they're going to whine for something, I'm not going to thank them. I'm going to just don't give them what they whine for. And then I don't give them something else that is good. The family might get it, but they don't get it. If they don't obey, they don't, you know. And I'm consistent. When they were small, I was pretty consistent with them. And after a little while, they know that they're not going to get it. And then it never became an issue. What if they, when they sin? Look, our children will sin. I guarantee you that. Because the Bible says so. The Bible said all of us are sinners. We all have sinned. It doesn't matter how much you shelter them. They will sin in their lives. Because you're not going to be able to raise the perfect kid, the perfect adult. You can't. You won't be able to. None of us will be able to. So it's a fact that they will sin. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes they sin and they hide it from us. As as a matter of fact, most of the time, our kids sin, they will hide it from us. You know, a couple of years ago, my son, my daughter, at different times, they each committed some bad sins. But in both cases, 
they both shared with me. Good thing or bad thing? It's really a good thing. Because I want to cultivate that kind of environment so that when they fall, that they know they can come and talk to me. Do you know now they can talk, especially my daughter, they can, she can talk to Kay really well about her situation, her life, and all these things. I am so, so grateful. But when they shared it with me, I could have, I had two, uh, two paths that I could, could have taken. One, how stupid of you? How can you do this? How can you sin like this? Don't you know what the Bible said? You're such a sinner. That's one approach, one path. The second, I am sorry that you're going through that. And it's a mistake. Let's ask the Lord to forgive, and what can we do to help you? Guess which path I took? Option two. Why? You know what my daughter said afterwards? She said she was so surprised. She thought I would be so angry with her. And she said she was glad that she shared it with me. Because what kind of environment, what kind of family do I want? And I also want that in the future that they can always come to me even when they're struggling with life and sin. That the door would always be open. Whether they choose to or not, it's their choice, but I want to make sure that that's always available for them. What if they don't get good grades? Well, I've talked a little bit about that already. Look, there's different reasons why they don't get good grades or why they don't want to study. And you have to understand the reason. If the reason is that they're not very good at that subject and they're giving the very best, then show them how much you're proud of them. I don't care if it's a C. If they come to you with a C and they give the very best and say, son, daughter, I'm so proud of you because you gave your very best to the Lord. I'm just so proud of you that you try because I know that this subject is so hard for you. It's a challenging one. It's challenging that I see you tried and tried and tried and you gave it, but I know it's hard. So it depends on the situation. That's number one. But if the situation is that they're struggling with laziness, there's other issues in their life. If it's a situation that they don't want to study because they're angry and they have lots of stones, then you're going to help remove the stones. You know, if they're lazy, you're going to help remove the stones. It's hard to fix laziness. It's hard to fix it when they're angry. If you don't remove the stones, you've got to remove the stones. So it depends on the situation. When they don't do their homework, that ties in with the good grade. You know, they don't want to do their homework. I am so thankful. 18, 19 years. You know, even seeing me when he goes to college now, his first year, I never have to tell him, see me, are you doing your homework in college? Because I've never had to tell him when he was young, did you do your homework? Never told Eileen, did you do your homework? So I've never had the stress that a lot of parents had when it comes to kids and their education. Because my goal wasn't for the kids to make straight A's, to get a good job and get a good, make good money. That's never been my goal. My goal has always been for them to do their best for Jesus. And whatever that best looked like, whether it's A's or B's or C's, whether they go to college or not, if God called them to be a missionary and that's what God wants them to do, I am very happy. So I've never put the pressure on my kids to get good grades. But do you know what? Both of them make really good grades. They make really good grades. 
and I never stressed over it. Never one time did I say, kids, did you do your homework? Never one time, kid, how's your grade? No, 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 no anger, no stress, lots of peace. Why? How did I manage that? Because the Bible said, what is more important when it comes to the work? Do it for Jesus. Don't do it for the grade. Don't do it, you know, for the money. Do it for Jesus. And if you understand that and you actually live it at home, then you don't have to stress over the academics. And not only that, but they will learn to give their very best for Jesus. And my kids in the schooling, they give their very best. That's why they're getting the A's. But I never said the goal was to get A's. The goal was to do the very best for Jesus. So I'm sharing with you some ways where you can become angry and if you choose the right path, then you don't have to stay angry. Now, let's talk about some of you who have adult children and they're struggling in their lives or they're struggling with the relationship with you or you're struggling with relationship with them. Now, these are older kids now. They're adult kids and there are different scenarios, of course. What do you do with all of that? So they're struggling, they're hurting. The relationship with you, not good. So how do you handle all of that? Good question. <clears throat> First and foremost, the most important, you need to get rid of your stones. You need to get rid of the disappointment, anger, not only towards them, towards your spouse. And then you ask the Lord, Lord, how do I love them more? Lord, how do I help them? And all you do is obey whatever God says. That's basically it, actually. It's really not that hard. Because the Lord will speak to you. And you will know. So this is the third step. Don't provoke them to anger. But it's more than that. But it's establishing an environment where you teach them the instruction of the Lord to live the life of righteousness, peace, joy, love, and power. See, it's very different. It's based on what is it that you want and how do you get there? So I'm, I gave you many different scenarios and some of these might apply to you, but there are many other scenarios and you're gonna have the same choice. You want the narrow path or the wide path? The wide path has a lot of anger. The narrow path has a lot of peace. But sometimes choosing the narrow path is not easy because it goes against the anger that's creeping up in you. It's just like the disc golf incident. I was a little bit upset for different reason, but I made a choice. I got rid of the anger. It's okay, so we can do it together. And in that case, I chose the right path. And because along life's journey, I've chose many times the right path, not 100% of the time. I've chose the narrow path many times, the right path. And as such, the children are doing well. But I've also chosen the wrong path at time, and it affects me, and it affects them. And I see some of its effect on them. That's why I said none of this is perfect. And some of you might have chosen some wrong path. But the good news, the good news is that we all can choose the right path starting today. Even though we made some mistakes in our, our past. So Father, thank you so much for our time together. 
And I hope, Lord God, that you would allow this message to sink in and that we would see stronger families coming forth. And for those who no longer have little children and they're struggling with their adult kids, that you begin to do a restoration. And for those who are just learning so that they can help others, but let it sink in their hearts that they might be able to use it to help so many more people grow in Jesus. Amen. In the end, well, that concludes the teaching for today. And um, so I am going to allow you to unmute yourself. And see, do you have any questions for me? I'm so convicted because uh, after all these things, the principle you can apply to your spouse, your children, and also your friends. So every mistakes I'm making, <laughs> I'm trying to improve. It. <laughs> I'm still making them. So I'm so glad today. <laughs> my my eyes and my thoughts keep turning, <laughs> thinking. <laughs> uh, which area, Miss Anna, was there any particular area that convicted you? Yeah, oh yeah, every, almost everything. I'm, I'm not saying I get angry anymore now, but I'm preaching. I'm just telling people what to do. People don't like that. So instead, I need to listen and say, yeah, I'm sorry you go through it. And let's ask, you know, let, let's do this. And then basically, is people have a different beliefs. And when I talk about the truth, they're going to be so offended that I know. But I'm only describing the truth, trying to present the truth, not saying I'm right or I'm wrong. I just said this is the way it should be. And because the point of view are different from you and me is because uh, basically it's the whole perspective of, of this world. And if you take the creation, if you don't take a creation, all the differences afterwards. Right. So then every time I try to present the, the, the truth, I, I speak about what God has created us to be, what's the purpose and all that. So people don't like to hear it. And some other people say, why do you have to antagonize those people. So when I say those people, my children, my adult children. So today I just uh, send a text said that, you know, I apologize that I'm preaching to you again. I says, uh, I'm, I'm provoking you to anger, it seems like. So I said, forgive me. That's all I did. With, with tears almost. Mm -hmm. Wow, Miss Anna, thank you for sharing that testimony. I'm, I'm glad this word spoke to you. And, um, you know, sometimes, think about this. A lot of time, the reason that we want, um, most of the time our motives are right, you know, because we love our kids. We want them to have what's best. But sometimes the approach that we take, even when we do this with our spouse, we do it with our husband or our wives. We love them and we want them to do what's right, but sometimes they don't do what's right. And when they are older, teenagers and adult, adult kids, for example, love is letting them, giving them the freedom to make the choice. You think about you think about the story about Adam and Eve. God loves them. And he gave them a choice. He put the fruit right in the middle. You know, of the garden. They had a choice. Love comes with freedom. And people have the choice to choose right or to choose wrong. So, I'm glad you shared that. 
the principle that you're learning will apply to any of the situation that you have. Even though I talk mainly about children, it applies, a lot of it applies to your spouse and apply it to life in general. Any other comments or questions? I have a... Oh, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, Michael. No, no, you go. Uh, I, have a, I have a real quick testimony to share, if I can, real quick. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, I had a, a gentleman I, I sat down with for the first time, and <clears throat> he was struggling with his teenage daughter. And um, <clears throat> to make the long story short, we sat down, and he came to me for advice on how to help fix his daughter and fix some things in his family. And after kind of going through the four questions, the main question, what kind of life you want to live? And we talked about some of these things. I'm going to send him this video, by the way, it's going to help him a lot. But he realized, and he said this himself, he said, you've opened my eyes to the fact that I, I came to try to fix my daughter and my family. And really what I need to do is, is work on myself. <clears throat> and it was so powerful to hear that happen and for me to watch that take place by using these questions and then this method and so I knew this training was coming up today so I knew I would have something to send to him <clears throat> because there's things he needs to hear and, and Miss Ann you were saying that uh, uh, you know you were convicted and, and I think we're all convicted in this because uh, God's word has a way of convicting us. So Simeon could have told us all that stuff, but it's because he tags it with scripture and we see it in the word. It's just like, wow, okay, I, I, I've made some errors, but I can fix this and change it by using God's word. And so um, I, I just got to experience that just yesterday with this man. And it was so, it's so touching and moving to be able to, within an hour, help this person recognize that he's got to work on his problems first before he can even begin to try to lift up the rest of his family. So it's just beautiful, powerful stuff. Mm, so wonderful. Thank you for that testimony. Man, that's, that's awesome. And it's just like with Anna and what David just said, it was, that's almost combined in those things just as this as, af, affirmation is the in the gift that God and the Holy Spirit have given you, Simeon, and, and it, it must be that NASA engineering background of able to simplify things and root them in scripture. So it's it's not the self-help video. It goes right down into the word of God, and it's so clearly the truth. It's also so convicting. So the one scripture that popped in my head as I was feeling like what a crummy dad think about all the times Margaret and I have fought in front of our kids and, and, you know, different things. And even though all my kids, it's, it's, it's good was uh, Joel, the Lord can restore the years the locusts have taken. And I, I think it's that point as people as David saying with that man he's like oh man gosh I got to work myself and all this stuff's a mess and it's this that God when you start putting this in is our conscience convicts us but just God just wipes that all those failures uh clean right just washes washes that away and they can start tomorrow and David just when you were saying that when that guy's trying to work on himself, but as he's doing it, he's actually, the Holy Spirit makes it's working on the whole family. It all works together. And it's just so simple. And, uh, but that list, I couldn't even write them all down, Sammy, and it was too long. So I was trying, <laughs> but, but I love how you said it. it's what kind of life do we want? What kind of life do you want? What kind of life does God want for you? And it's just phrasing like that and the Holy Spirit works. And then ask God, what do you want? I keep, I was been telling this to my kids and my wife. I said, hey, take that issue. Just ask God how he wants you to handle this situation with your boss or with your friend. And and they're they're doing that. It's just so it's so liberating. And um, 
I just thank you. Thanks all of you. And Anna, you're doing such an awesome job. I just don't, I saw your tears in your eyes and Miss Anna, just know it's incredible what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your encouragement. That's the one gift I know I do have. I've always been an encourager. So just keep throwing throwing those little words in. I'm just going to keep doing it. Only if I mean them. Thank you so much, Mike. I know you're sincerely helpful. Yes. I do wanted to point out something there. You know, all of us have made mistakes. We all have. And uh, sometimes people will think, you know, I wish, I wish I had done it differently. It's true. But here's the good news. Some people say, I wish I had known this 10 years, 20, 30, whatever years ago. But it's better to know it now than never know it. It's better to know it now than 10 years later. So the question then is, what do we do now with it? So Michael alluded to this. It's the list is long, the list that I gave you, and there's no need to try to remember it. But it's hard to try to remember and apply to every situation. Oh, this, this happened, apply it this way. This happened, apply it this way. No, 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 no. What's better is what Pastor David had shared. What kind of life do you want? If you want the kingdom life, righteousness, peace, joy, love, and power, then in every situation, how can you choose the path to live that kind of life? See, that makes it a lot easier. So this way, you, should, you always have a choice. And when you're in a situation, you don't have to remember, well, this list, and it says this, 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 you say this, you know, Pastor Simeon said this. It, you're, nobody taught me this. Nobody taught me that he was going to break a broken window. But my situation was like, right then and there, I had to make a choice. What am I going to say? I wish I can tell you, really, I wish I can tell you all the choices I've made have been the right choice, choices. Wrong. <laughs> but I have made some right choices. And more right choices than wrong choices, praise God. And you can too. But today I have to end a little bit early, so we're going to end it here now. Um, I have another meeting at 9.30. So I just pray, Lord God, let me see. I just want to make sure that nothing in the chat. Okay, let me see. Make sure I answer the question before we go. What do we do now? Even if we have only learned these things now, we can choose to move forward in a positive direction from now on. So encouraging. Thank you. Okay, Aaron, thank you for that word. Um, you learn this now, you move forward. Let the word of God become a part of your life. Grow in it. Don't provoke children to anger. By the way, sharing the gospel and provoking people for anger doesn't do much good. Just FYI. <laughs> but God is going to do a wonderful restoration for us all in different ways. And he's going to use it in our lives to help many others. So Father, thank you so much for our time together and for releasing this upon us today. And we give you glory for it. And we give you praise. So now, Lord, let our lives be transformed, our family be transformed, our relationship be transformed, so that people will see the Christ living in us and that we will be able to take it to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank and you. We'll Anna, we, we love you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Bye, Pastor. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Thank you.